Good morning and welcome to Collab Tech 09. My name is Lev Gonick and it's uh, my pleasure to be your host here on behalf of all of my colleagues at Case Western Reserve University. I want to just uh, begin by uh, thanking a number of important uh, colleagues um, who have helped to underwrite today's event and it goes without saying that without their support, uh, Collab Tech uh, would not be able to actually uh, be here and uh, the program would not uh, come together without their support. In particular, I'd like to thank our colleagues from Adobe, from Apple, from Blackboard, from Cisco, Dell, eCollege and Pearson, Gartner and IBM. Thanks so much for your support. A round of applause, please, to all of our sponsors. It's a full program. We've already kicked off, obviously, with a jam-packed set of sessions. It's cool in here. It's not cool necessarily everywhere. Thanks in advance for your, uh, your patience and forbearance with some of the elements over which we don't have a lot of control. There are some seats up front here, just to let you know if you want to join us up here. It is a packed house. Um, I also just want to share that uh, Collab Tech is all about the intersection of emerging technology and, tech, and the education world. Um, we have a plenary panel. In just a second, I'm going to introduce our uh, host for that. I also want to share with you that uh, there are folks uh, from around the country uh, in Second Life who've been invited to join us. And uh, they're actually uh, here to my right um, around the campus. In fact, if we were looking out the uh, window here at Thwing Center into uh, across the way to the Calvin Smith Library. Uh, you would have a chance to meet people and there'll be questions uh, from uh, Second Life as well. There's the Calvin Smith Library. On my left is actually a Twitter stream for back-channeling questions to our panel. So if you want a Twitter, just put in the Twitter uh, Collab Tech, Collab Tech, and you can ask any question that you want in real time on the stream here, and we'll, when we get to the Q&A, we'll have a chance to pick up some questions off of the Twitter stream if you're, if you're interested. And with that, I want to introduce my colleague, uh, Casey Green. For nearly 20 years, the Campus Computing Project under Casey Green has surveyed on an annual basis uh, the largest number of university campuses across this country and now around the world, surveying the emergence of um, technology and its impact on the academy. Uh, it's a survey that we uh, in the higher education community uh, significantly use both for benchmarking and for creating trend line analysis of uh, the impact of technologies uh, for strategic planning um, and also opportunities for doing important things like budget preparation, which is just about finished here for this year at Case Western Reserve. And with that, I want to introduce uh, Casey Green. Thank you. Thank you, Lev. Good morning, everybody, and let me add to Lev's comments to welcome you all to, to the second annual Collab Tech Conference 2009. Uh, this is the second one, I'm again, at, at Case, and as Lev, with his very generous introduction indicated, I'm Casey Green with the Campus Computing Project. Uh, let me add my voice on behalf of the panel, and hopefully all of you in the audience, again, to Case and to the Office of Information Technology Services here at Case for hosting this conference. Um, and also to the sponsors. And second, at least from my moment here as, as the, the moderator for this panel, offer congratulations to Case as well for kind of an interesting triple crown uh, this week in terms of announcements, collaborative announcements with a variety of technology partners, specifically Amazon, Cisco, and Linden Labs uh, that were announced earlier this week. Interesting, and I'm sure we'll be hearing more about that both as part of the conference and the hallway conversations as well. So our opening uh, panel today will be an attempt to, to map the terrain for today's conference. What's the state of collaborative technology in higher education? What are some lessons we might learn from, from other uh, environments and communities? Uh, what are the challenges that we confront in higher education with students, with faculty, with researchers in our efforts to foster collaboration? Are some of these issues about code? Are some of them about culture? Are they about disposition? Uh, in many cases, the unwillingness of students to say, I don't want to be part of a team because I don't want to be brought down by the lowest common denominator. For those of us who teach, we've had that experience as well. Uh, the good news is that this will be a PowerPoint-free presentation. So, <clears throat> <laughs> wow. <clears throat> Our, our intent today is really to have a conversation among the panel members, and with that, let me do some very quick introductions. There are long, longer bios on the website. Let me see if I can get the remote to work as well. 
So here we are, uh, alphabetically, uh, Steve Adler from Adobe has been a leader in integrating Acrobat and Acro uh, collaborative technologies to address learning and productivity with, with both campus communities as well as corporate communities. Trent Batson is the founding director of the Association for Authentic Experiential and Evidence-Based Learning, the professional association of the e-college community. Joan Getman is the senior strategist for learning technologies at Cornell University. Her work focuses on the alignment of IT services with best practices and current emerging technologies to serve the Cornell community and the higher education community. Neil Mehta, actually Neil is the one real doctor among this group. He has a white coat, the rest of us have some tweed coats perhaps. Uh, he's a staff physician at the Cleveland Clinic with joint appointments at the Education Institute, the Medicine Institute, and the Information Technology Division. And he's the Director of Education Technology at the Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine, which is a joint venture between the Cleveland Clinic and Case. We'll be hearing about that as we go forward. And in the center stage, amidst all the dark suits is Wendy Shapiro from Case, who serves as Senior Academic Technology Officer at Case Western Reserve, providing leadership and direction for campus, economic, I'm sorry, campus academic technology applications and initiatives. A um, little bit of housekeeping. Uh, first, you'll notice that some of us have avatars. Everybody looks so young and chiseled in Second Life. <laughs> um, some of us who actually didn't have avatars want to thank Wendy and Sue Schick, Schick from Case for giving us avatars and giving us identities. Sort of the New Yorker cartoon brought to life, the old one from 1964 on the internet, nobody knows you're a beagle. If you need somebody to explain that to you, you haven't spent much time on the dark side. Um, a quick housekeeping matter as well, Lev mentioned the, the Twitter stream. Uh, we're going to try to have the conversation. The angle isn't very good for us to see it. We'll try to come back to some of the questions. Our hope with the Twitter stream, for those of you both here with us live and in Second Life, is that this does not descend into an American Idol moment. In so uh, whether you're voting us on or off the stage or the platform or you know, commenting about our attire or demeanor or anything else. So having taken care of the housekeeping items and everything else, let me try and frame the conversation very quickly, and then we'll get to, to the panel members. Uh, and the first part of this is to say, well, where have we come in the last couple of decades with technology and other things in higher education? It's been roughly three decades since business schools across this country, if you will, discovered the notion of teamwork and actually forced MBA students and later undergraduates in, their, in programs and, uh, into actually working as teams as part of one of the goals of the MBA and later the business community, uh, curriculum. We know that the internet has broken down the boundaries of place and space in terms of collaboration for colleagues to send files to one another, people to share data sets, people to do collaborative research. We know that annotation and editing tools from a variety of providers, Adobe among them, the, some of the, we, uh, Microsoft in terms of some of the features in Microsoft Office and other applications as well, continue to evolve. Sometimes they're evolving faster than the average of the mobile user, but we continue to see more and more of these kinds of tools as part of the ubiquitous tool set available to us. We could probably make the comment that social networking for many of us and certainly many of our students is a ver version of kind of a soft collaboration given the way they use a lot of the Web 2.0 applications in their lives. And it would be remiss to say, let's see if this next one, well, that's missing. All right, so what's the last point on here is supposed to be that you know, perhaps the next frontier in this conversation is how much of this is actually about code and how much of this is about culture in terms of the way academic organizations work and the technologies that are available to those of us in the campus community, students, faculty, researchers, as we move forward. So the first question, not for 10 points, by the way, but at least I'm going to turn to Joan Getman from Cornell. Joan, you have the not so small challenge for us of kind of mapping the state of collaborative technologies, where we've come, and a little bit of where we're going to go. Many comment that at least within higher education, our reach still exceeds our grasp. There's a lot that we'd like to do. The technologies are there, but we haven't quite gotten there in many cases, um, both in terms of the research applications and the way our students work and the way we work with our students. And as I said earlier, some of this actually may be about the code, some of this may be about the culture. So give us the first map, if you would, please, Joan. Yes, thank you for that challenge, Casey, when you gave that to me. I, I wasn't sure I was going to thank you, but I'll give it a shot. I was thinking of doing this as slam poetry because I have about two <laughs> minutes to do it. Um, I think the first thing I would say in terms of exceeding our grasp, while a lot of things are working, the users are in charge and we have lost control. And I think that's a, a bit of a strong statement, but institutionally, we are losing control. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, it's sort of a moot point because it's happening. And what I mean by that is that we need to redefine how we, quote, control 
these kind of collaborative mm -hmm. technologies and other technologies. Our, we might be redefining that as guidance, support, and education for our users about risks and benefits. Um, and that's because these technologies are constantly evolving. They're lightweight, agile, remotely located services, cheap, fast, pervasive, flexible. That's many of the technologies. Mm -hmm. Some of the technologies where we're not able to, um, to grasp them and implement them the way we want are maybe the higher end, um, or we have higher end video collaboration, which is not accessible to everyone as one example. And another piece is that um, I've been in a lot of conferences where voice drops out. You know, we still have bandwidth and infrastructure issues. So um, the technology is evolving quickly. It's not always exactly there. And we find ourselves often piecing um, the technologies together to make them work. Um, according to Gartner's report in October of 2008, social networks are the big thing. They're closing a gap, as the Gartner report describes, between really inflexible closed systems of information and the kind of chaos of having information privately held on an individual faculty member or student computer. So it's participatory, it's building resources, and it's collecting knowledge. Um, there is an expectation. Um, we hear from employers who hire Cornell students, we love your students, they're bright, they're brilliant even, but they don't know how to work together sometimes. So do we know what the skills of collaboration are and are we integrating that into our curriculum and leveraging the technologies appropriately? Um, it's essential to resolving issues in research. We have scientists who got together to resolve E. coli with the spinach contamination. It happened fast, it happened immediate, and it was a transparent process. So all these are opportunities, and even um, Larry will be talking about the Horizon Report um, at lunchtime, but that was an experience of a group of a team coming together quickly, people sharing information through wikis and social bookmarking and publishing something that ended up being a report that is a version that's dynamic. It can be, it, it's um, published and it can be cited, but it's also dynamic because there's a format for it where you can continue to comment. That's the kind of um, really transformative aspect of collaborative technologies. And those kind of groups can come together and stay together. They can, they can go apart. And that's that social networking influence. And I think while learning communities have existed forever in academia through learning societies, they're closed. What collaborative um, technologies are introducing are the idea of collective intelligence, of public intellectuals, of citizen scientists, of people coming together and crossing the boundary of our closed academic uh, learning environments. Um, and so that raises challenges as well. Um, do we know how to collaborate? What are the skills of collaboration? There are so many technologies. What are the right ones to use? Are we lining up what we're trying to accomplish in our learning outcomes with the right technologies? Where is our institutional content anyway if everyone is putting it in different servers and services and hosting it here, there, and everywhere? Where is it? Um, and making assumptions that all of our students are technologically savvy is not always a correct assumption. Um, copyright, intellectual property, policies, data stewardship, privacy issues for students, and what scholarly publication looks like. All of these are issues that are being raised by, and that are out on the landscape right now. Um, where we need new assessments, portfolios, you're gonna hear about those. Not only are they offering an opportunity for assessments, they're offering a new opportunity for learning through reflection. And finally, we used to think about choosing the right system, maybe we should be thinking now about putting uh, lightweight applications together in more flexible ways and helping people manage loosely coupled pieces. So the big question for me is, is academia ready for greater transparency, open collaboration, and a culture of sharing? And can we afford not to be ready? Great, thank you. Wendy, I want to turn to you and give you a chance to build on some stuff that Joan has given us, uh, not the least of which is a whole opportunity to go into alliteration, control, collaboration, content, copyright, certification, competency, other kinds of things. I think we began, and I want to pick up at least to start on Joan's point about control, because I think for many of us in the campus community, we began to see the control slip away from us with the arrival of the internet and particularly wireless in the classroom, and the kind of Oedipal aggression of students who could say, oh, 
Professor Jones, you know, your slides are out of date. I'm on the website of the you know, National Science Foundation, the Security and Exchange Commission, the Wall Street Journal, and this is the stuff that was posted today. Why are you showing us data that are three to five years old? Or the fact that students could reach out to faculty members, not just cross department, but cross town and through the internet, and have a direct exchange with, with an, an original author as opposed to be dependent on secondary sources. So take us down that path, because you also work directly with faculty right, right. on these so, issues. So um, I'm going to kind of back up, and I think I'm going to answer. You're going to do a political thing. You're going to answer a different question than the one I have. <laughs> well, I think it's going to address the question, we'll actually. We'll get there. All right. But no, but in a different way. And I'll tell you, because when we decided to do this panel, I really started to, started to stop and think about what does collaboration mean for education? What is this thing? And, and what about the way that we even put education together? And I do believe that there's two major pieces that influence students' behavior. One is the way that you design the curriculum, and two is the way you evaluate the students. And that, that has a huge impact on what's going to happen. So, so you talk about control and all those other C's. I mean, it requires a lot of thinking. So I'm going to use an example here as I get into a, a positive on, on how a piece of this worked at the university. We have one department that, um, you know, there, there is this, this move from lecture. So they decided to change their, their curriculum to move from the lecture format into problem-based learning. And I know you're going to follow a little, but, but you know, you're the clinic and we're case. And so, but anyway, to problem-based learning. And um, so, so in this way, the curriculum design changed, mm -hmm. but then also the way the students are evaluated. So the evaluation is both in the process of coming to the resolution of the problem, as well as solving the problem itself. So if you look at that in terms of assessment or evaluation, um, it's a highly collaborative process. The students are out there foraging for information. And, and what's interesting about this is different students have different expertise and they have different learning styles which will influence how they go after information and bring it back. And it gives them the freedom to do this. Um, wikis were critical to this. So we all know what wikis are. These are not the latest technologies, but they're highly collaborative environments. Um, what I think is really interesting is as more multimedia comes into play and your students are looking to analyze a problem together, the visuals influence the analysis in, in a lot of ways, it, this, this collaborative thinking. Um, so then, then the whole social networking world that, that Joan was talking about, you know, there's, now there's voice threads as well as text threads. And, and we see these things changing, the multimedia sharing, tagging, annotating. We're talking about the new Kindle this morning, you know, and, and the ability to do some of these things. Um, so, so why are these things so successful in this process? I mean, besides the curriculum, besides the, the way that they're evaluated, it's informal, the process is informal, it's flexible, it's active, it's not prescribed. And I think that's huge. Wendy has given me a nice handoff in terms of not prescribed collaboration. She talked a little about the clinic. No, Medical no, I talked about, no, I didn't. No, I talked about, uh, she <laughs> provided the handoff. This is a local issue of geopolitical boundaries between case. <laughs> if you live in town, you know what this is about. But, but I want to, medical education becomes very interesting. And if, if you actually, if you think about the academy, you know, I mean, ultimately, we didn't talk about this collaboration, but the ultimate kind of academic experience is the apprenticeship. One apprentices oneself to a senior scholar, or you know, and think about the history of medicine. For a long time, was this kind of apprenticeship, and then it became very prescribed after the report, uh, the, uh, the the Flexner report, uh, the early part of the, of the last century. The Lerner College is one of the newest medical colleges in the country, um, has a very distinctive approach to curricula in terms of problem-based as opposed to a traditionally prescribed kind of curricula. Where does the collaborative role play into this? And I'm particularly curious, if, if I, my inferences are correct, about what I would characterize as probably a, a kind of a tech-enabled high-touch aspect to, the, to what the technology provides and the collaboration that may be part of there. But help us along, if you would, please. Yeah. I think great question, and you know, I find found myself nodding all the time when both Joan and Wendy were talking. I think we are all facing 
pretty much the same issues, except uh, when you talk about open systems and closed systems, uh, medical education brings up a special issue because we are talking about often uh, case-based learning which involves patients. And immediately, if you start t thinking about putting information in Facebook and people discussing, uh, it may raises special issues. So circling back to your question, um, I have to put one word in. I'm not going to say, hi, mom, but this is our uh, <laughs> year where our uh, first class that enrolled in the college is actually graduating next week. And I'd like to say congratulations, class of 2009. That's great. Um, it's been a terrific journey, and I think a lot of you here know the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine. I think it was really, truly a great collaboration between two big institutions here, and it's succeeded. How you define success is a different story. Mm -hmm. But the basis of how it was started, and I think that gets back to your question, is the philosophy was we would create or produce a group of people who would be reflective practitioners of both medicine and science. They would have a drive for lifelong learning, and this would be complemented by a self-critical approach, need to self-awareness, and self-improvement. And how can you do this in the setting of medical education? And uh, you know, if you think about medical education, traditionally it's been first two years you do basic science, you sit in a big lecture hall, and you get lectures, and you sit probably miss half of them and you'll read up notes later. And the, Very heavily prescribed. Very heavily prescribed. It's very much teacher-centered. And to move that, all the other issue here is all the faculty are people who have gone through that same process and they think it is the correct process. And now you have a new school or a new track starting and you have to convince a group of people whose first reaction is going to be, you think what I went through was wrong? You want me to change myself even though I think it was working, it worked for me, look here I am. And that's a huge challenge. Um, uh, you need a lot of uh, motivation, courage of conviction, and obviously you need a good sponsor to get this done. But then uh, I think once you convince people of the philosophy, you need to build systems that support it. It needs to be easy. And I think that's one of the things we've done. I mean, there are three things that I think makes the college program stand out. One is the problem-based learning that we already talked about. Again, if you think about it, it's a case. You'd say, gosh, you put it up on a website and people looks at, look at the case and talk about it. What's so difficult? Well, remember, these are small groups. They're groups of eight people working together, and they work at their own pace. So each group can be at a different screen on the page. So they need to be split up and proceed at their pace. But at each screen, they have some learning objectives that they need to resolve. Now, how do we know that they resolve them? That's the goal of the facilitator. And so we need to let the facilitator be in the room, decide that they need to proceed to the next screen because they have resolved the learning objectives here. You need to build something that supports that level of um, uh, permissions for each group because each group has a different facilitator. Uh, think about our assessment process. Uh, we have a competency-driven assessment. You know, we call ourselves the no paper, no grades, no lecture medical school. And it's I don't even like to sign up for that. <laughs> yeah. Does but, it come with a practice plan afterwards? <laughs> <laughs> And uh, it's a fully uh, funded, uh, it's a full scholarship program, too. And so you also get health insurance as a student, right? Uh, yeah, we're uh, all in. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, to. yeah, I think you can make a career out of being a medical student now. So, <laughs> uh, so what the thing with uh, assessments was, if you don't have grades, you know, traditionally we have just said, you sit in the USMLE, you sit in your boards, and you are a good doctor. And all of us think we have our best, the person we chose to be our physician is the best doctor but half of them were in the bottom half of the class. So what is a good doctor? <laughs> and that raises the issue is it's more than just medical knowledge. There's a whole set of competencies. And now we ended up making an assessment system that is got no Likert scale, has no grades. It's basically competency-driven, narrative, and you can just give feedback on areas for improvement, and areas of strength. Mm -hmm. And the goal is you're not spending time trying to differentiate one student from the other, saying this student is better. 
you're really helping them all meet the standards that you set for each competency. Mm -hmm. And how do you build a system like that? And then each student creates an e-portfolio where they write a brief essay, but they are citing evidence from all these assessments. An average student at our school basically gets a couple hundred assessments throughout their five years. Each of them has some narrative comments based on competencies. Now you need a system that funnels all this, mm -hmm. lets the students search for the comments, cite appropriate comments, write an essay, and b basically they're writing a research paper every, every quarter saying how they're doing. But you're also talking about a system where data becomes a resource, not a weapon. It's Absolutely. a feedback mechanism. Yeah, yeah. I think that gives us a good segue to, to turn to Trent. Uh, the whole issue of e-portfolios have taken off in the last several years. I know that at least from campus computing, we see an, uh, almost an explosion. About half of campuses, at least four-year institutions, now have some kind of e-portfolio. It's become pro forma in the world of, of teacher education in terms of NCATE standards. Um, and yet there's this kind of ambiguity because Again, going back to the prescribed environment, we don't have the grades, we don't have the, the rankings. Um, how do we translate that both internally as well as to external audiences, whether it's board certification or employers? I'm going to let you map us through that, Trent. All right, first I'm going to uh, say once again the association that I direct uh, because Casey left off one word. Oh. I, I, I uh, uh, created the association that has, that has the, uh, the most confusing title you can imagine and no one can remember it, so I'm going to say it again. It's the, uh, it, and it's the Professional Association for the ePortfolio Community. But the, the name of it is uh, the Association for Authentic, Experiential, and Evidence-Based Learning, or ABLE, A-A-E-E-B-L. So it, it's a new association, and it's meant to be the professional association for defining competencies and developing out what an what a ePortfolio professional is. Um, I, were, I used ePortfolios as a teacher when I was teaching composition. Um, I rolled out an ePortfolio system at the University of Rhode Island when I was director of academic computing there. I was also chair of the board of the Open Source Portfolio Initiative uh, when we got our Mellon funding uh, and we developed the Open Source Portfolio which is now part of the Sakai system. Uh, and now I am directing this professional association. So I've had a number of years, 15 years, of very heavy involvement with ePortfolios, but I'm also aware that a lot of people aren't all that clear on what it is or they are. The question is about ePortfolios and collaboration. Um, but what comes to mind first with ePortfolios is uh, the value of reflection. Uh, and in a, a student having the capability of collecting work in a convenient way and being able to uh, recall it and have it in one place, have it web accessible so you can always see it, and then being able to see the changes in the work over time. And there seems to be a, a great value, particularly in young students, in seeing how they change from the beginning of a semester to the end of a semester or over an academic year or over an academic career. And, and then being able to make comments on the changes that they see in their own work. So that's the value of reflection. It's a kind of a sort of a self-assessment. Institutions also are using e-portfolios based on the input from the students because the, in, the students are making comments about their own work. The institutions are, are mapping the, their progress toward learning goals by using the e-portfolios or data reported from the e-portfolios. And so over time, the institution is also doing self-assessment. I mean, they sometimes this is forced on them by accrediting cycles, but uh, this is another way to add many more data points for an institution to see how they are doing uh, on the students progressing toward these identified learning goals over four years or, over, or within a program or within a major or whatever. Um, but on the other hand, in terms of collaboration, uh, especially if your portfolio is web-based, if your system is out there on the web anyway, so you can always access it no matter where you are, it supports mobile teamwork or problem-based work or project-based work so that people learning outside of the classroom can then use the ePortfolio system as a way to see each other's work and to see the changes and 
uh, the, the people within the portfolio, you can set permissions as to who sees the work. Even you can see for how, how long a time. So you can set up collaborative groups with an e-portfolio system and therefore be able to constantly be you know, aware of, of, of who's doing what. And Casey mentioned the thing about students not liking collaborative projects because then you know, some can get away with doing nothing and others do all the work. Well, what I see developing is people assigning certain roles to people in collaborative groups. You know, one, student, one member of the group is the web developer. One, another student is the statistician. Another one is the publicist. Another one is the writer, et cetera. You know, and then they, they can switch those roles so that at all times, they have an individual responsibility within that collaborative group. Uh, so that seems to be a, a, a trend. Um, Let's, let's hold for a moment, because I want to turn to Steve uh, in the oh, sense okay. of resources as well. We'll I come back to some much, of the... I had a much more You'll have a chance, promise. <laughs> and if not, we'll, I had a whole we'll, list here. If not, we'll send you into Second Life. So okay. uh, <laughs> we all have a second chance in Second okay, Life. Right. Steve, Acrobat's evolved, you know, originally as a, as a transport document, if you will, you know, across uh, a variety of different operating systems to really becoming a collaborative tool. And there are other kinds of collaborative tools that come from tech providers as well. You get a chance to see what we do in higher education, you've had a chance to see this in other environments as well. So it, it kind of in that pivot point of, of walking back and forth across cultures, you know, what have you seen about collaboration with or without Acrobat that, that we do well in campus communities and, and what could we learn from others? It's interesting. Uh, you know, when education institutions approach challenges, um, you know, they have the freedom to explore in their own ways, mm -hmm. but you end up, and I use this phrase, with islands of independence. Everybody does it their way. In higher education? Higher, We're yeah. shocked. I think <laughs> if we look at, at Second Life, how many, <laughs> Educational institutions or organizations actually have islands. They don't. They don't share with you know their yeah. space with anyone else. But um, this is great for you know the pursuit of knowledge. But you know the, when you look at a, a collaboration mandate now, which mm -hmm. is really what industry wants and is looking for, you know Acrobat evolved over time really for publishing and advertising. Right. And the advertising side was the commenting across and quickly. Um, the uh, in the corporate world, you know. Uh, Workers and teams mm -hmm. need to uh, fall in step more quickly. You know, they, it's my way or the highway. You know, that's mm -hmm. in many cases you, you've got deadlines, you've got to fall in, into place. Um, so, whether it's a corporate team or an academic team, uh, the way the tools are utilized has as much to do with team culture as it does with support and training and uh, planning. And uh, when you have a uh, situation like this, Adobe has so many collaborative tools in place now in, in this Acrobat family, you know, whether it, it be a traditional Acro Acrobat environment, or we go out to the web now with Acrobat.com, uh, we go to Connect, and the ability to uh, kind of tailor the uh, collaboration technology to the kind of workflow that would work best for uh, the team or the environment, uh, we see a lot of things changing. and. Um, Having the time to explore these possibilities, again, is really a luxury in the corporate world, but it's really a fantastic benefit in the academic world. We mm -hmm. can explore, we can work things out. But in the end, there has to be some kind of standardized uh, or agreed upon workflow that is going to allow this you know, sharing of knowledge and, and collaboration to uh, be sh uh, effectively you know, searched, shared, and uh, archived and called upon mm -hmm. when needed. Uh, this seems to be a swifter process in the corporate world because we have deadlines. Uh, you well, know, but we, also in the corporate world, you have command and control in a way that we don't have in higher education. Sure, there's that. You know, that in amazing. one sense, somebody says it must be done, and you know, in all honesty, it's more likely to get done. Many would say in a corporate environment against the kind of some would say soft deadlines of a campus community. Exactly. So I think you know, looking at all these in context. Um, the utilization of these tools really has to be evaluated in the context of the infrastructure, of the culture that's there, and how that support and design is being uh, rolled in so mm -hmm. that there's quicker adoption, and uh, especially in the area of working with you know, uh, undergraduate and graduate students, giving them a place uh, or an experience so that when they get into the, yeah. the, the corporate world, the, Collaboration is good. Several of you have mentioned the issue of culture, and I, I certainly, in one sense, teed it up. Let me do a quick, and I mean a very quick poll of the panel. Is the larger challenge for us in the higher education community as we look at the, the, the potential of collaboration 
peer-to-peer -peer researcher faculties working together, faculty working with students. Is the cha larger challenge for us one of culture or is it one of code, meaning the tools and the resources available? And I'm just going to go quickly down the panel. Neil, I'm going to start with you. Code or culture? I think probably a little bit of both. I, as far as the code goes, <laughs> oh. sorry. Uh, I have to be, no, as far as the code goes, I think it's familiarity with the mm -hmm. code. The tools are there, but getting faculty to, or students to know them. And then the culture of the institution's already there. Steve, code or culture? I, I have to say, living on both sides of the fence now, culture. Wendy? So, so um, I'm just going to say You're going to answer a different question. Real, real, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> no, real quickly, when they were saying doing research on things like this, you now have to look at anthropology, psychology, sure. sociology, so I go culture. OK. Trent? Yeah, culture, too, because uh, different departments on campus that are not used to working together now need to start working together, and it's, it's, it's a learning a whole new way of interacting. John? Culture wins. Culture um, wins. I think that culture, that collaborations exist, existed in academia for a long time, but they're very managed and controlled yeah. collaborations, and this technology is a wild it, it, it frontier. It brings to mind the quip of Elson Floyd, who's now president of Washington State, who on, in a number of public forums has said in the conversation about change in higher education, culture eats anything else every day from the start of the day. So if it's culture more than code, because you're all very smart, you've all dealt with this, what's the single most important thing we can do about culture? We'll go back the other way. Joan? Um, is it one thing? Just one thing. One? You, get one th you get one item. <laughs> um, get the faculty and students for whom, who have experienced a change in culture to talk about it okay. and to say what, what went on and why that was so wonderful for them. Trent, single most important thing we can do about fixing the culture? Uh, bringing disparate groups that are not used to working together all around a, a, a particular project. Mm -hmm. around Wendy? Change. Leadership behaving in collaborative ways. OK. Right. Recognition and reward is part of that with leadership? Steve? Cultivating the seeds that are there and right. growing them. Of course, Neil. I would say start a new medical school. But <laughs> <laughs> well, but you had a chance to do that. You're telling us that you know, there's, and, there's, and, and, some yeah, things don't go away. Us. It worked for us. That was yeah. the stimulus. But you know, more seriously, I think if you have power users in each area mm -hmm. and who have the respect, they can slowly infiltrate this technology and culture. Mm -hmm. All right, so I've got to be, I, my role as moderator is I also be, have to be conscious of time, and we're getting to what is sort of the close. And quite honestly, my glasses are so bad, I can't see the Twitter stream. So I don't know if there, people have gone Maybe American so Idol on us or not. It, Lev, is there a compelling question that we have to throw to the panel? And if you would please identify who you are, because you're here with us in real life as opposed to That's correct. the folks that are hiding <laughs> elsewhere. Please. Hi, I'm Mark Majors. I'm from the Cleveland Institute of Art. I'm their web manager. Also and known as the CIA, right? That's correct, the CIA. Thank you. <laughs> the question I have, I guess it's, it's what, we started getting into SharePoint, but what other e-portfolio web systems do you use? And is it self-proprietary or is it out of the box? And then how do you keep that data private? I guess I, that probably goes to, let's, let's very quickly from the panel. There are about. 40 different vendors of e-portfolios in the country. Uh, I think Case, Case is looking at one or two different ones. Uh, so there's a whole variety of different options. Uh, some are downloaded to the campus and it's a program on the campus. Others are web-based, so there have to be security layers uh, for those. Um, they're all, they've all been tested over the years for, for security, so they follow all the FERPA guidelines and you know, protection of student privacy. But in one sense, it's, it's almost like the Facebook problem as well, yeah. in terms of ultimately some of that responsibility is the individual user, so, is it not, Wendy? So, so let me, we're, we're right in the process now of launching a big e-portfolio initiative, and it's a challenge to figure out the best method to go. On the one hand, you want it to be able to be like database driven so you can generate reports for accreditation and, and reporting. And on the other hand, you want a student side that's highly flexible and the student owns, and how do you find these two worlds? That's why we're actually looking at two separate 
elements so that the flexibility is almost the interface and then the, the database piece sits, you know, and one can feed the other so we could generate reports. And Neil at Lerner College, do I, if as a potential patient of one of your doctors, do I want to be able to access his or her e-portfolio to find and, out how they did in the lab? So that was our prime consideration. It's oh. behind a firewall and it's a proprietary product that we ended up building ourselves, partly because our needs were different, partly we wanted to be sure where the data was. All right, I see the mic's moving. Um, is I'd it, like sir? to just add please. Oh, I'm sorry, that, Steve, you know, please. As an Acrobat evangelist, I mean, Acrobat provides security on a document-by-document -document basis, right. a user-by-user -user basis, and the portfolio protects the individual components security as well as the portfolio itself. So it, you can re, students can own, own their material, put it up when they need it, secure it behind firewalls when in place, but it's very versatile in that uh, to address those kinds of issues. Um, okay. And you know, different. Looks like uh, I'm getting signaled about a question in the audience. And again, if you would stand, <laughs> identify yourself. My name is Dave Baldwin. I'm with Aquarian Technology Systems here in Ohio. Uh, the question I have is, even relative to today's meeting, is when will and, and what are the steps being taken to uh, integrate and upgrade new facilities in education that actually support the uses of the technologies you're talking about as opposed to the traditional classroom model and, and institutional model is the facilities for technology and collaboration uh, don't seem to always be in sync. Ten point question about facilities to the panel? Well, you've got to build a new medical school, Neil. <laughs> well, I mean, my standard answer, it sounds like a broken record now, is start a new, build a new school. Yes. But uh, we, essentially, I think we were incredibly lucky. Is mm -hmm. We had people who were the, had the philosophy of how the school would work and the technology needs all sitting together as we were uh, shaping the space. Yeah. So, so I'm inferring the question is about learning spaces, whether it's right. learning sp labs right. redesigned right. as learning spaces. So for PBL, classrooms. yeah. You know, well, you know, certainly here at Case, you know, it's a balance. It's like, how do you maintain what you have while you're being innovative and moving to support the future possibilities? And we try to do that. You know, I mean, I know a lot of us from our group are here, and we try to do that. And and it's um, a challenge and an opportunity, and we're we're always striving for it. We've had many many successes here. Jonah, it's also a little bit about culture and cash. I want to give you a chance to respond as well to this question about learning spaces and, and culture. I thank you because I think that's one. I agree with Wendy. It's a real balance, especially if you're on old campus. We're not going to tear down our historical buildings, and um, we look at opportunities with new buildings. But we're also rethinking our lab spaces. We're looking at thin clients. We're looking at portability, mobility and really trying to pay attention to that so that things are much more lightweight. At the same time, we have a medical school in Qatar and we have a medical school in New York City, so we have to have some high-end facilities that are very um, carefully structured and built to enable flawless collaboration. Um, and so we've got both things going on, sort of guerrilla tactics and also the very carefully architected solutions. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm missing the cue. Oh, okay. From Second Life? Yeah, please. From Second Life. Um, Lulu Zenfold asks, um, I'd like some elaboration on how to change the culture, the culture challenge. The culture challenge. It's uh, two aspirin and call us. <laughs> <laughs> Stay away from faculty meetings. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I, I, honestly, I don't know that we have a week to do that. So I'm, I'm going to actually kind of defer on that one. Uh, but I will give each member of the panel very quickly, about 10 to 15 seconds for a last closing comment, either to reinforce something or if, there's by, you know, if we've missed something in this con opening conversation about collaboration. I'm just going to go straight down the panel. So Joan? Um, I'd like to add something that I've left out before. To me, one of the exciting things I'm seeing in terms of transparency is this idea of focus on the process, having an archive and, and a record of process. And so, for example, a digital lab notebook project that we're working on where um, lab notebooks have always been a really valuable piece of the scientific research um, archive. But now they're digital, they're shareable, and you can see what's been tried, what's not been tried. And I think that that whole focus focus on process, not just product, is something incredibly valuable. Great. Trent, quick closing comment. Because of the way that education is transforming, uh, where there's more experiential learning and more varieties of, of, different, of student learning, I think that the electronic portfolio is, is perhaps the ideal tool 
for educational transfor and transformation in this century. Wendy, thank you. A quick closing comment. Okay, um, I'm just going to say I know we have um, many people here from the from the business world, and this is in aims for what we're doing now with collaboration and looking, we, we actually are learning from the ways that business works in pulling together their expert teams and, and, and so how these, not only collaborating within our university, but collaborating with our community and with the business world. Thank you, Steve? Being able to collaborate on a variety of documents, you know, rich media, and being able to organize it in a way that makes sense to you know, the individual and then to be moved into the team framework uh, effectively is key. Great, thank you. And Neil? Um, just uh, you know, looking at recent trends like YouTube, University, Academic Earth, TED Talks, and all the social media tools and how the web is taking off, I think we're, it's really exciting time that maybe we'll have democratization of education where anyone can get education anytime, anywhere the way they want it. And actually the transparency might be the factor that opens up that culture for change, possibly. That's great. So I want to thank the five of you, uh, Steve Adler, Trent Batson, Joan Getman, Neil Mehta, and Wendy for your comments and your willingness to play a little bit this morning. Our thanks to the folks, those of you who are here in real time, those who, the, the culture of the Twitters and the culture of Second Life for joining us as well. And at this point, I'm going to give the, the podium back to Lev Gonick. Thanks, Casey. Please join me in thanking the panel. Great, uh, great first plenary panel. Um, just again, encouraging you to uh, take a quick look at your programs if you're not sure. Uh, hopefully most of you arranged to register you. online Don't because those are the folks you. where we assign basically seats you <laughs> to the area. Uh, our next panel's uh, breakout sessions uh, begin in about 12 minutes. Uh, we will see you back here um, for our lunchtime keynote speaker with Larry Johnson from the NMC. Thanks and have a great uh, breakout session.